Hi friends! Welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. In today's video I'm going to be talking about all the books that I read in the month of February. So here's the thing. I have an anxiety disorder that is sometimes fine and sometimes flares up. February was a very high anxiety month for me and everybody copes with anxiety and mental health challenges in a variety of ways. I know that there are a lot of people who, when they are struggling, can't read. I do the opposite and read too much. <laughs> so I read a lot of books in February, more than I normally want to be reading, to be honest. Once my reading gets past a certain threshold, I can tell that I probably need to, you know, like, make sure my other coping strategies are in order, schedule an appointment with my therapist, all of that, which I am doing. I have therapy this week. I've been getting back to some other coping strategies, but I, in February, was kind of tearing through romance audiobooks as a way of coping with that anxiety. And while effective, it means that I read a frickin' huge number of books that I need to talk about, and I read a lot of romance. I did read other things as well, of course. It's gonna be a very romance-heavy wrap-up, as you'll see when I get into my reading stats. Anyway, that's my preface, because I feel like sometimes people get a little bit in their feelings when people read very large numbers of books. I sometimes get people being like, how can you read so much? And I am generally a high volume reader, but February was unusually high and not for good reasons. Like I don't want to be reading as much as I read in February. I just was trying to cope with my mental health. So anyway, all I have to say, if you're new to my end of month wrap ups, the way that these work is I talk about all of my reading stats for the month because I am a stats nerd. I enjoy looking at this stuff. If you're not interested, you're welcome to skip ahead to where I start actually reviewing the books that I read. Of these books, the ones that I read in the first half of February, I talked about at greater length in my mid-month wrap-up. I will link that video up above if you want to go and check it out. In this video, those books, I will just tell you the title and the star rating. I'll direct you to my previous video if you want to hear more, but I will get into all of the other ones. Okay, so let's talk stats. In February, I read 44 books for a total of 13,451 pages, which is an average page count of 480 pages per day. <sighs> um, yeah, that's, that is a lot, and to me a sign that it was a difficult month for me. So, <laughs> so let's hope that March is a little bit more reasonable. I, generally want to see my average pages per day right around like 360 to 400. So the fact that we're up to an average of 480 a day, uh, it's a lot. It's a lot. Um, but we're going to talk about all of those books. <laughs> 22 of the books that I read were advanced reader copies or books sent to me for review, so about half of them. I had three DNFs this month. We'll talk about those. I did not read any graphic novels, Eight of the books that I read were indie or small press. I read one translated work and I had one reread. As I said, I did listen to a lot of audiobooks. It was a lot of romance audiobooks, others as well. But this month I read seven physical books, five ebooks, and a whopping 32 audiobooks. <laughs> ah! Yeah. Oh, good lord. Yeah, I did this. I. You know, instead of scrolling through TikTok all the time, I was listening to audiobooks and also I've been trying to get back into exercising again because that is also a thing that helps me manage my anxiety and I like listening to audiobooks when I exercise. So lots of audiobooks. Of those audiobooks, 15 of them are what I term shelf, which means I had a physical copy on my TBR shelf and I got it off either via audio or primarily via audio. And in terms of where those audiobooks were coming from, seven of them were from Audible, two of them were from my library, eight of them were from Libro FM, seven of them were audio review copies from NetGalley, and eight of them were from Scribd. I have noticed Scribd is a lot better than it used to be. I didn't used to be able to read more than like three, maybe four books from Scribd on a good month, so the fact that I got eight and still could have kept reading, like they're upping their game, which I think adds a lot more value. So I, 
yeah, that I'm impressed with. Libra FM, some of these are books that I purchased. I am a subscriber to Libra FM. Some of them are influencer review copies, which I get for free in exchange for mentioning them. If you're interested in checking them out, I will link them down below. I do like them because the proceeds of my purchases through them go to support one of my local indie bookstores, which is awesome. Next up, let's take a look at age demographics. I was primarily reading adult books and reading a lot of romance. So 36 of the books that I read were targeted at an adult audience. Six of them were targeted at a YA audience. Three of them were targeted at a middle grade audience, and I did not read any children's books this month. Next up, let's take a look at publication date. In February, the earliest published work that I read was from 1817. 16 of the books that I read were backlist titles published prior to 2022. 10 of them were 2022 releases and 19 of them were 2023 releases. These numbers are wild, y'all. I... God, I read a lot this month. Um, I did do a good job with hitting my diversity benchmarks in general. I am aiming to read about 50% from Black, Indigenous, and Person of Color authors and at least 25% from openly queer authors. This month, 38.6% of the books that I read were by openly queer authors, members of the LGBTQIA community, and exactly 50% of the books that I read were by Black, Indigenous, and Person of Color authors, so kind of hit that on the nose. And of course, because it was Black History Month, I was focusing on reading Black authors, so 30% of the books that I read this month were by Black authors. One other note that I wanted to make, a subscriber had reached out to me after I did a, a yearly stats update, and I really, really appreciate it. They wrote a very kind email to me pointing out that it might be helpful for me to make some changes in how I frame certain elements of diversity. So I want to apologize for any harm or discomfort people may have experienced because of the way I chose to frame things. Because I think it's an important element of diversity in books, I had wanted to start capturing people with a Jewish identity, and I did that in a way that I think was less than ideal, and I really appreciate somebody mentioning that to me. So instead, going forward, what I'm doing is I have a separate column in my spreadsheet that is going to be looking at any specific religious representation that I'm finding in books. Now, a lot of the books that I'm reading don't have any specific religious representation, but for those that do, I'm now putting that in a separate category instead of lumping that into the ethnicity piece of it, because there were, I think, some valid concerns about how some people have chosen to use anti-Semitic stuff in negative ways. And I certainly don't want to feed into any of that. So that is a change I wanted to admit. I did not fully think through the ramifications of my choice to do that, and I apologize. So thank you for uh, helping me to do better. That said, let's talk about the genres I read. I told you it was a heavy romance month. It was. 17 of the books that I read were romance. Five of those were historical romances, eight were contemporary romances, and four were speculative romance. And speculative is going to be your sci-fi, fantasy, or paranormal romance. I was reading across the gamut this month. There was a lot of it. I also read eight fantasy books, seven science fiction, four horror, three literary fiction, two mysteries, one contemporary fiction, one nonfiction, and one poetry. So a variety of things, but lots of romance. Now in terms of star ratings, I had a freaking amazing month, y'all. I read so many good books so many good books. It was pretty wild. I think in terms of star ratings, this might be one of the best months I've had. I don't know. See what you think. So in February, one book got one star. I did not give out any one and a half or two star ratings. One book got two and a half stars. Four books got three stars. Two books got three and a half stars. 17 books got four stars. Wow. Eight books got four and a half stars seven books got five stars, and three books got six stars. And in my personal rating scale, a six star read is what I give to a favorite of the year. So yeah, wow, a lot of books that were four stars and up, three new favorites. It was a really good reading month in terms of enjoyment for what I was reading and quality. The average rating for the month was four stars, which is definitely up from what it often is. I also had one book that I did not rate. It was a 
unpublished manuscript that I was beta reading. So that is counted in my total number of books read and pages read, but I don't give ratings to manuscripts. Lastly, before we move on to all of the books, this has been perhaps the longest introduction and stats section that I've had in a while, uh, let's talk a little bit about my yearly challenges. These are honestly going pretty well. I have four challenge TBRs that I set for myself for 2023, and I'm going to update you on those. I have currently read two out of the five books on my classics TBR, two out of the five books on my science fiction and fantasy TBR, one out of the six books on my Star Wars TBR, and three out of the six books on my nonfiction TBR. So yeah, feeling really good about that. That is going quite well. With that said, let's go ahead and talk about all of the books that I read. I will start with my DNFs and then I will go from lowest rated to highest rated. And again, for any of the books that I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up, I'm going to direct you to that video if you want to hear more details. In February, I had three DNFs or books that I chose not to finish. Two of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. Those books are Wild Blood by Lauren Blackwood and The Foxglove King by Hannah Witten. If you want to hear my thoughts on those, go check out my mid-month wrap-up. I also DNF'd Missing Clarissa by Ripley Jones. This was an e-arc that I had from Neck Alley, and I DNF'd this one pretty quickly, a lot faster than I normally do. I only read 10% of this, but y'all, I just, I could not suffer through any more of the writing. <laughs> like, Oh my gosh, my brain was rejecting it. I knew pretty quickly I probably would want to DNF it and I tried to push through a little bit. I got to 10% and I was like, no, I can't, I cannot read this anymore. No, I just like, y'all, <laughs> I don't know. The writing, I, I did not enjoy the writing choices. The premise of this sounded interesting. It's a YA thriller about two high school students doing a podcast and researching a girl who disappeared years ago. I've got to say, I am currently reading an e-arc of another book that is kind of similar, that also has high school students doing a podcast about a true crime thing, and it is so much better written. So I think there is a way to do this well, but the writing in this was weird. The tense choices were strange and not working. It was chaotic. The characters were annoying. I just could not. The other thing about this is, y'all know if you watch my channel, I am a huge advocate for diversity in books. I think having good representation of people of all different kinds of racial, ethnic backgrounds, disability, sexuality, all of that is great. This book, this book though, was so heavy-handed with the way it was trying to do diversity. Like normally, you know, I see those reviews of people being like, oh, this is just forcing diversity down your throat. And normally I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> was it though? But this book actually <laughs> was. I'm like, listen, I'm with you. I want diversity, but like, th what are you doing? No, this is not it. So anyway, I... I ended up DNFing it. Really, really did not get on well with the writing style. Other people seem to be liking it better. I will say that if you were looking for something like this, and again, I'm not too far into it yet, so I can't speak to the entirety of the book, but I do trust this author because I've read from her before. A Long Stretch of Bad Days by Mindy McGinnis is a book coming out soon that has a very similar premise, and the writing is just a lot better. So maybe try that. Moving right along to the books that I did finish reading, I gave one book one star, and I did talk about it in my mid-month wrap-up. That is Hidden Pictures by Jason Rekulak, and I also have a standalone spoilery video review discussing this book as well. So if you haven't seen that yet and you want to, go check it out. I gave one book two and a half stars, and I also talked about it in my mid-month wrap-up. That book is When He Was Wicked by Julia Quinn, book six or seven, I think six in the Bridgerton series. Then I gave four books three stars, and I have not talked about any of them yet, actually. And now that I'm looking at it, all of these, most of these were audiobooks as well. And for reference, three stars is not a bad rating for me. Three stars is I liked it. I would recommend it to people. I enjoyed it. It just didn't rise to the level of loving it 
for whatever reason. There could be a variety of reasons for that. The first book that got three stars for me was Chick Magnet by Emma Berry. This is a debut contemporary romance with a pretty fun premise and I enjoyed it pretty well. Like it, it wasn't a standout for me but I had a good time with it. There were things about it that I thought were executed really well. It was a good debut and I would read more from this author in the future. It follows a woman who is a chicken influencer and the veterinarian who kind of hates her because he feels like she's convincing people to get chickens who don't know how to properly care for them and it's affecting his job. So kind of a dislike to lovers thing. It's cute. They have some cute banter. There are some more heavy issues that it deals with and it has COVID in the book, which I think people have very mixed feelings about whether they want the COVID pandemic to show up in their contemporary fiction yet. Yeah, and she also has a very toxic ex. I, I will say some of the stuff of how successful she was so quickly on YouTube is, you know, less than realistic, but it was a pretty good time. Parts of it were really funny and I enjoyed it. I did want a little bit more from them as characters and there was a lot of information about chickens, which I just don't care that much about. But I think if you love chickens, this could be a big hit for you. So three stars. I liked it, didn't love it, but I would read more from this author in the future. I also gave three stars to Ghost Music by On You. This is literary fiction with a little bit of a paranormal horror element to it. I had the audiobook as an audio review copy from Libra FM. I don't think know that this is something that I would have discovered on my own, but it sounded interesting and it was interesting. I liked it and I see what it was trying to do. I'm having trouble putting my finger on what about this book didn't entirely work for me because I think there is a world in which I could have loved this. There are a lot of literary horror novels that really connect for me very well, but there was something about this that just didn't quite work. It's a little bit of a weird novel. It follows a Chinese woman who is married, she's a piano teacher, and her mother-in-law is coming to live with them. And her mother-in-law is pushing her to have a baby. And she also wants a baby, but her husband refuses. And weird things are happening. She's having dreams about this sentient talking mushroom. She starts getting these boxes of mushrooms in the mail mysteriously, and then some other stuff happens. I think this is a book that is trying to say something about the connection between life and death and cycles of grief and beauty. And I, I, I liked it, but I didn't love it. Like there was something about it that just didn't totally connect for me, but it was definitely an interesting experience and it wasn't terribly long. The audiobook was good. I also gave three stars to Her Lessons in Persuasion by Megan Frampton. This is a historical romance novel with a nerdy amateur astronomer heroine who's a spinster and her young new stepmother who is pushing her to get married and this young barrister that she falls for. I liked it. It was enjoyable. It was fun. It was a good light historical romance. It just didn't rise much above that for me. I don't know that there was anything about this that was particularly special or memorable, but I had a good time with it while I was reading it. I think it kind of did the trick. I, am I going to remember anything about this? I mean, do I remember much about it now? No, but I had fun with it. So three stars. The final book that I gave three stars to was Marple 12 New Mysteries by 12 different authors. This is a collection of short stories that are all about this figure, Miss Marple, who is a famous character by Agatha Christie. They're all short mystery stories. And I liked this. I don't know that I'm the best person to review it. Mara really loved it and I think has more substantive things to say because she has actually read all of Agatha Christie. I am not terribly familiar with the Miss Marple book, so I can't really speak to that. I'll just say that as a collection, it was fun. It was enjoyable. There were a couple of stories that stood out that I particularly enjoyed and I thought did something really interesting. And then there were some that I found to be a little bit dull. But overall, it was a fun collection. It was an enjoyable audiobook listening experience with a full cast. I think the two standouts that were interesting to me were, uh, it was, who was it? It was Alyssa Cole and one other author who I think did something a bit different taking Miss Marple and putting her in a different context and adding some diversity to the characters she was interacting with and the things that she was dealing with. So yeah, this was fun. Three stars. Again, 
I don't have a ton to say just because this is not my specialty, but I enjoyed it. And this is another one that was an audio review copy from Libra FM, one that maybe I wouldn't have picked up on my own, but it was fun. Moving on, let's talk about my three and a half star reads. This month there were two of them, and I have not talked about either of them yet. These were both books that I had for review through NetGalley. The first one is The Pledge by Kale Dietrich. This is a queer YA slasher novel, which I like. I think it's fun. I thought this was a very good version of what it is. I had some quibbles with the plot that I get into a little bit in my Goodreads review, and my Goodreads is always linked down below if you want to go follow my written reviews where I get into a little more detail. But I thought this was very fun. It does get a bit violent, especially for YA. There are a lot of bodies dropping, but it follows this young gay man who is starting his freshman year of college and going out to pledge to a fraternity. Now he has this dark past because he had survived a serial killer attack and had actually killed the guy who was attacking him. And he's gone through a lot of therapy, he's ready to move on, he's starting at college, and he's got a crush on one of the fraternity brothers, there's like a little romance moment happening there, but then people start dying. And the person who's doing the murders is wearing the same kind of mask as the guy who originally was attacking him. And things happen. So if you were looking for a very gay YA slasher book, I think this will definitely do the trick. I had a good time with it. I enjoyed it. I mean, there were like a couple of plot things and writing choice things of some of the perspectives that it was telling the story from that didn't totally work for me. But overall, it was a fun time. And I think if this is something that you're looking for, I would recommend it to you. My other three and a half star read was The Scourge Between Stars by Ness Brown. This is a sci-fi horror novella had an audio copy from NetGalley. It follows a young woman who is the acting captain of a spaceship and uh, there is something not quite right. There's something in the walls. It's very fast paced. It has a super low-key sapphic romance. No, I wouldn't even call it a romance. Basically it's just that like the main character is a lesbian and there's a girl she's into so it has a sapphic element to it but it is primarily this very fast-paced, action-packed, sci-fi horror novella set on the spaceship. I thought the ending was a little bit too neat and easy and I think kind of took me out of it a little bit so I didn't love the way it wrapped up but overall I had a pretty good time with it. I've seen some people comparing this to Alien which I've never actually seen Alien. I probably should at some point. But based on what I know of it, it seems maybe a little bit similar. So if you're looking for a more diverse version of that kind of sci-fi space horror in novella form by a queer black author, go check this out. Moving right along, we have my four star reads. There were a lot of them. Did I say 17? I think there were like 17 four star star reads. I did talk about a lot of these in my mid-month wrap-up. Eight of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. Those books are Blue Revolution by S.E. Martins, Coming Home by Kennedy Ryan, From a Certain Point of View by a whole bunch of authors, Never Let Me Go by Kazuo Ishiguro, That Time I Got Drunk and Saved a Demon by Kimberly Lemming, The Cage of Dark Hours by Marina Lostetter, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness by Michelle Alexander, and The Severed Thread by Leslie Vetter. Whew, that was a lot. So if you want to hear about any of those, go check out my mid-month wrap-up. We had a lot of four stars in the first half of the month. I also gave four stars to 1919 Poems by Eve L. Ewing. This was also free from Libra FM for Black History Month. It's a pretty short poetry collection drawing on the Chicago race riots of 1919. And I liked this. I think it was an interesting way to interact with history. I learned some things. I thought some of the poems were really lovely and evocative. I'm glad I read it. I would recommend it. I also gave four stars to My Dear Henry by Kaylin Barron. This is the latest installment in the Remixed Classics series that Fierce Reads is putting out for teenagers. I really like these in general. I think most of them are really good and do some interesting things. They're bringing on authors of color or queer authors or people with intersectional identities to remix new versions of classic novels for teenagers. And this one 
one is a remix of the Jekyll and Hyde story by a queer black woman. I really liked this. I think the project of it is very interesting. It's clear that she knows the source material really well and I like what she did with the story. She subverts the original in a way that is tackling the racism and homophobia that existed during that time period and follows two gay black young men who fall in love in a time when their love was illegal and very very looked down upon and a time where they already had a lot facing them as black men living in London in the 1800s. Uh, and then it pulls in the elements of the Jekyll and Hyde story. Really enjoyed this, really liked what she did with it, and I thought the author's note was interesting as well. I will say, because I've seen a review talk about this and it's not wrong, there are <sighs> There are some elements of the prose that are a little cringy and overwritten. She overuses the phrase, my dear Henry, which is the, the you know, the title of the book. And there are a couple of <laughs> very cringy phrases that I was like, oh, really, really, that's what we're going with. However, don't let that detract from what this book accomplishes because I think it's really very good and still well worth picking up some of the prose quirks aside. So I did give this four stars. I had a New York from Neck Alley and I would recommend it. Then I gave four stars to Nerd Crush by Alicia Emmerich. This is another one that was a audio review copy from Libra FM and I really liked this a lot. This is one where I am kind of irritated at the reviews that I see on NetGalley because I feel like a lot of the people reviewing this just never should have picked this book up in the first place or don't understand the specifics of why this book is such a fantastic version of what it's trying to be. This is a contemporary YA coming of age story and romance that is written for teenagers. I would even say for the younger end of the YA category, this is a book you could hand to a 13 year old or a 14 year old. It's very accessible and I think reflects the realities of what it is like to be an awkward introverted teenager who has a crush on a boy and is into all of these different things that are maybe less cool, especially within your own community. One other critique that I'm seeing on this book a lot, and I want to talk about this, I know I'm not the ideal person to, and I hope that, I'm curious to see if Ashley at Bookish Realm reads this and kind of get her take on it. But one thing I'm seeing a lot of reviewers say is like, oh, this just isn't how it is anymore. No one cares if you're a nerd, you're not mistreated, it's not the 90s. And I kind of want to say, yeah, to a certain extent, but it is still more of an issue for a lot of black kids, depending on where they're growing up. And that is part of what this book is dealing with, is not just how she's being treated in general as a nerd, but specifically how she's being treated by, for instance, her cousins, who think it's weird that she's into like white stuff um, because she likes cosplay and manga. And I think that that is a real issue that some nerdy, geeky black teenagers are dealing with. So, yeah, there's a lot of negative reviews of this, but I thought it was very charming. I thought it was very, very good. I just think it's not written for adults and it is not written to be a crossover book. It is written for a specific demographic of teenagers and particularly younger teenagers, which I think is great because I know Ashley has talked about the fact that there are not enough books being published for that early YA crowd because YA starts at like 12, 13 years old and when all the YA books getting published are appropriate for like 16 and up, that leaves a big gap and I think that this is a great book to fill in that gap. So anyway, that's my, uh, <laughs> I'll get off my soapbox now about that book, but I really liked it. I gave it four stars and I think especially if you are a librarian or a teacher or you have kids of that age in your life, it might be one to pick up. What else? I also gave four stars to On the Hustle by Adriana Herrera. This is a very steamy adult contemporary romance that is a lot of fun. It follows an Afro-Latinx woman who is finally quitting her day job so that she can get up and running her bookish boudoir business, which sounds amazing to be honest. She does interior design for bedrooms and other rooms that are inspired by people's favorite books, which I'm like, that is so cool. Can somebody do that? That'd be amazing. So she does that. Her boss, who she doesn't like very much just because he doesn't really talk to her and is very particular about how he wants things, is this hot young ex-Olympic swimmer who now runs a business empire that he inherited from his dad. 
Except, as it turns out, he's delighted that she's finally quitting because he has had a thing for her for the three years that she's worked for him and has had to keep it to himself because it would not be appropriate as her superior. But now that she doesn't work for him anymore, he's gonna go after her and try to pull some strings to get her on a reality TV show with him so that he can try to make something happen. So yeah, I really enjoyed this a lot. They are both very horny people. <laughs> And there is a lot of high steam stuff that takes place. I, yeah, I liked this. He would not be my personal cup of tea. He's a little bit high handed in the way he does things. However, I think it works well for her. She is this intensely independent workaholic woman who deep down really just wants somebody to take care of her and man, will he do that. So on the hustle, four stars. Whew. 40 minutes. Oh my god, guys, this is gonna be a long video. <laughs> this camera is gonna overheat soon, and then I'm gonna have to pause. My next four star read was Romancing the Duke by Tessa Dare. I told you I was going hard in the romance. This was what all that I wanted. I had an audiobook of this, and I've not picked up a Tessa Dare book in a while. I've been kind of hoarding the good ones that I haven't read yet, but this seemed like a good month for it. This was really fun. It's a historical romance following a plain spinster who has inherited a castle from her godfather except when she shows up there it is being inhabited by the blind nobleman who says what are you talking about this has belonged to my family for generations it's not yours and she's like no it is people must have sold it even if you didn't know it and I'm not leaving and uh also it's kind of hilarious because it's got like LARPing in it her dad was this popular author who wrote these sort of medieval fantasy stories and he's got this huge fan base that do LARPing. <laughs> it's just, it's fun. Tessa Dare is great. I love her books. They are fun and entertaining and have kind of a modern flair to them. They're sex positive. And uh, yeah, I had a good time with this. It was delightful. We are, oh my god, there's so many of the four stars, y'all. So many. All right, my next four star read was That Time I Got Drunk and Yeeted a Love Potion at a Werewolf by Kimberly Lemming, related to a book you saw me mention earlier that I read in the first half of the month. The first book in the series was the book club pick for my Patreon book club and I just had such fun with it. I decided to pick up the next one too. These are really funny. I think honestly the titles give you a great insight into exactly the type of humor these books have. They're very campy, very tongue-in-cheek, very self-aware paranormal romances and I got the biggest kick out of them. I will say I think the plot of the first book is stronger, but I liked the banter and relationship and romance of the second book more. They both got four stars for me. I really enjoyed both of them. I will read on from this author and it's one of those things where if the, the humor works for you, you're probably gonna love the book. If you don't like the humor, you, it's not gonna work for you, but they're fun. So if you're looking for a good indie author, although I think she's getting picked up for traditional publication from source books. So stay tuned for that. Continuing on with my uh, anxiety prone romance journey, I also gave four stars to The Beautiful Things Shop by Philip William Stover. This is a very cute male male small town romance that is opposites attract. And if you're looking for gay romance written by gay men, Philip William Stover, may I recommend him to you. This was really cute and it's not super steamy. There's one slightly explicit scene towards the end, but not even that much. Like it's mostly just cute banter between two people who are opposites, who hate each other, but also are really into each other. They have to share a shop space. And one of them is this kind of buttoned up introvert who is an antiques dealer. And the other one is this very outgoing, fun guy who does pop culture collectibles and they do not get on well at the beginning even though they're secretly attracted to each other and slowly end up working together and having this relationship and it was just it was very cute there was a bit much sometimes on the lack of communication element but it, so so if that really bothers you it is definitely present but it was fun it was a cute little small town romance and gave me what I wanted, four stars. I also gave four stars to The Demon's Bargain by Katie Robert. This is an erotic romance novella between a bisexual witch and the non-binary demon that she summons for a deal. 
and they have to solve some problems and have lots of sexy times. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's, it is, it is what it is. It delivers what it says it's going to deliver. K Katie Robert does a good job with this kind of thing. It was fun. I liked it. Four stars. One more four star read. We're almost at the end of them. This was the biggest category by far. My final four star read was The Mimicking of Known Successes by Malka Older. This is a Tor.com novella. Thank you to them for sending me a copy for review. I really enjoyed this. It's a sci-fi mystery set on a human colony on Jupiter with a sapphic side romance that's got kind of Holmes and Watson vibes to it that I feel like is done really well. It's got a little bit of a Western vibe to it at times too. The writing style took me a bit to get into, but once I did, I really loved it. I liked their relationship with each other. I thought it was fun. I thought the sci-fi elements were really fascinating in terms of how a uh, living on Jupiter could potentially work in this world. I liked the mystery. This was just a really good time. And it looks like it's supposed to be the start of a series, which I am anxious to get more in because it was it was very fun. Four stars. Also, if you're joining me for Tor.comathon, it is now out. So this could fit some prompts. Just saying. Whew, that is the four stars. Hey, next we're going to go on to the four and a half star reads. There were a bunch of them. How many four and a half star reads do I have? Oh my gosh, one, two. I had eight four and a half star reads and three of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap up. Those books are Kiss Her Once For Me by Alison Cochran. This was adorable, adorable. Promise Boys by Nick Brooks and Real by Kennedy Ryan. If you want to hear about any of those, check out my mid-month wrap-up. Also, for Real, we do have an episode on Chapter 3 Podcast with Izzy from Happy For Now devoted to discussing this book, so you can also check that out. I also gave four and a half stars to Persuasion by Jane Austen. This is the one book that I reread this month, also in preparation for a podcast episode. We're going to be doing one on, I believe, March 14th, where myself, Izzy from Happy For Now, and Alexa Dunn, maybe Liana, we'll see, but at least the three of us will be going live to discuss the book by Jane Austen and the new Netflix adaptation. So what did we think of it? I think there's going to be some strong opinions. It's Izzy's first time ever reading Jane Austen. This was fun. Not my favorite Jane Austen novel, but I had a really good time with it and there's a lot I like about it. I talk more about it in my Goodreads review. This video is already so freaking long. I'm not going to get into it here, but stay tuned for that episode to hear more of my thoughts. And hey, it's another four and a half star read with a podcast episode. It is Sword of Destiny by Anders Lezhsipkowski. This is the second book in our Witcher read along. This is one I'm doing with Liana at Liana's Library. And we actually just recently did a live episode discussing this in depth. It is the second short story collection in the series before you get into the full length novels. And I quite enjoyed it. I really like the characters, including some of the characters people love to hate, like Yennefer. Listen, I give me a prickly woman. I love I love a prickly prickly heroin. I think she's uh, she's interesting. So yeah, really enjoyed this. Again, not going to do a deep dive because we talked about it for more than an hour over on the podcast, but four and a half stars. I gave four and a half stars to Take the Lead by Alexis Daria. This is a re-release of her debut romance novel, and it was so good. Like, I figured it would be fun, but I didn't expect to love it as much as I did. I picked it up because the premise of it seemed entertaining. It's got a Latinx heroine, and she is a professional dancer who ends up falling with the person she's partnered with on a Dancing with the Stars type show. And I was like, cool, done, sold. That sounds like fun. But it's so much more than that. And oh my god, I love it so much. It was so good. I had a New York of this one from NetGalley. And the the hero is like this big, sweet, cinnamon roll dude who's got some other things that you wouldn't expect going on. His family has a reality television show. They're like survivalists in Alaska, but there's more than meets the eye. Our heroine is really concerned about not wanting to be pushed into a showmance uh, where it's like a fake relationship for views because she's fighting against some of these stereotypes of the like spicy, sexy Latina woman and she wants to be taken seriously for her work. It was just, it was so good. And their relationship was so good. I loved it. Four and a half stars. Highly recommend. This was excellent. I also gave four and a half stars to The Adventures of Amina El Sarafi by Shannon Chakraborty, or S.A. Chakraborty. This one, she's 
going under her full first name. She wrote the City of Brass trilogy and this is the start of a new series that is really fun and it's playing into a micro trend that I am personally a huge fan of and that is having writing fantasy featuring middle-aged moms as your main character. Like I love a badass mom. Is it because I am a mom who is in my mid-30s? Probably, but do I care? Nope, because this was really fun. So it follows a woman who had been a notorious pirate smuggler who had retired from that life to raise her daughter who is now like 12 years old but for plot reasons is forced to go back to the high seas as a woman like in her 40s or so and it was just it was great. Also she has a husband who she thinks is dead but maybe he's not really dead and also he's not human and doesn't know about their daughter. That's a complicated relationship. There are adventures and shenanigans and treasures and magical things happening and the camera did in fact overheat and I needed to change the battery but uh, we are back. As I was saying the adventures of Amina El Sarafi was very fun, very enjoyable, a strong start to a new series. I'm anxious to see what else we get further from it. And it is clearly drawing on a lot of real history of the Middle East and of this period, which she gets into a little bit in her author's note, though it's definitely through a magical fantasy lens. So yeah, I had a really good time with this. I liked it. There were points at which it was a bit plot heavy for my taste. I do prefer something that's a tad more character driven than what this was, but overall very good. I gave it four and a half stars and I will be continuing on with the series. Rounding out my four and a half star reads is another book you can chalk up to my anxiety and desire for light, fluffy, low stakes romance, and that is The Half Orcs Maiden Bride by Ruby Dixon. This is a relatively short novel that was perfect. It was exactly what I was looking for. It was fun and campy and silly and sexy and had a surprisingly sweet and adorable romance between the two while also being quite steamy. So this follows a woman who is a spinster. She's a very tall, large, full-figured woman who thinks that nobody wants her, but then her father, who is awful, tells her that he is marrying her off to somebody and she'd better go through with it or else, and he turns out to be a half-orc. But as she discovers through the process of their very spicy wedding ceremonies, he is completely taken with her and enamored of everything about her and is a complete sweetheart and very concerned about the fact that she has not been given a thorough sex education and he wants to make sure she knows what she needs to know and is completely comfortable and like that everything is good. It does a great job I think with consent especially given all of the specifics of the story and also seeing her come into her own and stop being this like scared introverted woman that her abusive father made her to be and like stand up for herself was lovely. It was so good. So yeah, this was like silly and campy and also really sweet and very, very steamy. So if you don't want something that has a lot of sexy stuff in it, you know, Ruby Dixon may not be for you, but I really liked it. I gave it four and a half stars. It was great. Whew, we're getting there, y'all. Next up is my five star reads. This month, there were seven of them and two of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap up. Those books are The Duke's Secret Cinderella by Eva Devon and The Wild Robot Escapes by Peter Brown. If you want to hear my thoughts on those, go check out my mid-month wrap up. I also gave five stars to Feed Them Silence by Lee Mandelo. Listen, this is a very weird horror novella that probably won't work for everyone, but it really worked for me. And, you know, I think part of why it worked for me is because of the experiences I've had and the place I am in life. So I totally get why this is not hitting for everyone, but I loved it. And also this confirms to me that I love Lee Mandelo's writing. I feel like they're kind of a polarizing author. Summer Suns was their debut novel. I really, really loved it and a lot of people did not like it. So I think whether or not this writing or this type of horror that's a little more philosophical and slow and weird works for you, it, it's it's gonna be a toss up, but it definitely works for me. Feed Them Silence, okay, listen, it is, it's weird. 
but I think it works. It's set in the near future and it follows a middle-aged lesbian woman who has a relationship with her wife that is kind of fraying and falling apart. Meanwhile, she's diving into this research project that she has gotten funded where she will be neurologically linked to a wolf in order to experience what it's like to be in the head of that wolf and it, it, like it's it's weird but it's like this building of tension where we're seeing this marriage kind of fall apart bit by bit and at the same time seeing things get weird with her being in the head of this wolf and that starting to affect her brain and I think the reason that this worked for me so well is that I am in a long-term relationship myself, which I think is a lot of what this is about. It is the horror of what can happen to a long-time relationship that is not well taken care of. All of the things that she and her wife are dealing with are exactly the kinds of things that do crop up when you've been married for a while if you aren't actively working to fix them. And so I was like, this is very relatable. I mean, like, thankfully, we are working to try to combat some of the things that they have let slide. But a lot of the specific things are, I think, really relatable to long term relationships. You know, I've been with my husband for a long time. How long? Like 12 years? I've been with my husband for like 12 years. And that's a long time to be with somebody and things do come up and it is something that you have to kind of pay attention to and especially if you have workaholic tendencies which i admittedly do that can cause problems and i think you see that in this novella so i just loved it i loved the writing style it is weird but i think the the horror elements mixed in with the tension of this relationship really worked so five stars for me and uh, I will probably read whatever Lee Mandela decides to write in the future because I'm a fan. I also gave five stars to Front Desk by Kelly Yang. This I originally heard about from Ashley over at Bookish Realm and I had picked it up for my kids. And listen, this is a book that is excellent but not what I was expecting. So we read almost half of it as a before bed book before my kids were like mom we don't want to read it anymore <laughs> it's too sad and scary and I was like that's that's fair like the, the cover makes it look like this is going to be a fun silly light-hearted book it is not it is quite a heavy book. Now I think it does a really good job of dealing with important issues in a way that is accessible for younger readers but you know, maybe not right before bed and maybe not for my six year olds. This is a book that I would say sometime in the next year, my almost nine year old could pick up. And I do think it prompted a lot of really important conversations because this is talking about issues of immigration, about racism, about poverty. And those things I think are really valuable, but the main character she really gets put through the ringer and I understand why for my kids they were like mom oh my gosh it can feel a little relentless at times. There are definitely moments of it being lighthearted and it has a lot of heart and it is excellently written. I think this would be a fantastic classroom book for like third fourth fifth graders as a jumping off point for a lot of very valuable conversations. I also think that if you're prepared to have those intense conversations, this could be something you can just hand to your kids. So I think it's a great book. I just think know that it is a bit heavy with the topics that it deals with, but still five stars. Excellent. Three more five star reads. We're getting there. We're getting there. I also gave five stars to Lone Women by Victor Lavelle. This is my first time reading a full length novel from Victor Lavelle and it was really good. I did this as a buddy read, which I think was a good way to read it with Mara from Books Like Whoa, Angela from Literature Science Alliance, and our friend Jocelyn. And um, yeah, this was really interesting. It is historical horror following a young black woman with a secret. She's leaving behind her parents who have been killed and taking with her a mysterious locked trunk that anytime it's open people seem to disappear and she's going to survive and start a new life for herself in the wilds of Montana and 
I, I don't want to say too much about this because this is the sort of book that I think you should go into without knowing a whole lot, but it is brilliant. It is such a layered novel. There's so much nuance to the characterization, to the way that he does themes, and there are so many themes. Oh god, it's just, it's, this is hard because it's one that I can't talk too much about because I don't want to spoil it, but god this book is so good. And we had a lot of really great conversations about it in the buddy read. I'm glad we buddy read it and all of us loved it, which is rare, honestly. I think it's rare that you get a buddy read where everybody is a fan, but we were all fans of this. And uh, yeah, it's got a lot of great representation of people of color, of queer people, indigenous people. Um, yeah, I don't want to say anything else about this, but it was five stars. It was really good. And after this, I definitely want to go and read more from Victor Lavelle because, okay, I can't, I gotta stop. I can't talk anymore about it, but it so good. Thank you to the publisher for sending me an early copy. And um, actually, this is a book of the month pick for February. So it, best believe I'm definitely getting myself a finished copy from them. I also gave five stars to Not Without Laughter by Langston Hughes. This is on my classics TBR for the year and it's really good. I knew of Langston Hughes as a poet from the Harlem Renaissance but he also wrote a couple of novels and this was his first one and it was really good. It's a buildings Roman, which is like a, a coming of age story, but written for adults, not written for teenagers, following a young boy growing up in a poor family in the Midwest. And like, if you're able to read this and get your hands on the introduction to this edition, I highly recommend it. I think reading the introduction first gave me a lot of great context for what I was reading and the importance of it. One thing that I think is interesting is that at the time Langston Hughes was writing, almost nobody was writing about low class black people in fiction. Most of the black writers there were focused on middle class and upper class black people. And so it was unusual to have something depicting the lives of working class black people, of sex workers, with a range of kind of morality in the traditional sense and making them into complete characters that you care about and creating interesting parallels between people who are super religious and people who are not but are similar in interesting ways. It's it's really incredible and I think provides a portrait of the lives of a specific demographic of people from what they know is probably drawing on his own experiences growing up in that area from a working class family, providing a window into the realities of this demographic that not much has been written about. The other interesting thing about this that was unusual, especially for the time, is there are nods to possibly the queer identity of the young boy. It's not a big thing, it's a small thing, but even what is in this was very unusual for the time. Yeah, I, I, I don't feel like I'm the best person to give you an in-depth review of this, but it was very, very good. And I was so invested in all of the characters and this young man kind of growing up and coming of age and figuring out his place in the world in relationship to all of the other people in his life. It was great. My final five star read was another romance. <laughs> this was The Secret Lives of Country Gentlemen by KJ Charles. I cannot believe I have never read from KJ Charles. I know that she is very popular for her queer historical romances, but I had never picked her up. And this was delightful. There was an audio review copy on NetGalley and I was like, listen, I am in a, a, a moment where I am wanting all of the lighthearted fun romance. So this sounds perfect to give it to me. And so I listened to the audiobook for review and it was just, it was so much fun. The banter was excellent. It was a rollicking good time. The plot was great. And I just, it was, it was so good. I need to read more from KJ Charles apparently. This is a historical male male romance. And it follows Sir Gareth, who has had an anonymous fling with a man he met in London for a week before they kind of break things off in not the best way. Fast forward to his cold, distant father, who he didn't even live with growing up, dying and leaving him a baronetcy in this swampland where almost everybody in the local town is involved with 
people who were smugglers during the war between England and France, right? So some things happen. He causes some problems for the local smuggling family and gets confronted by the head of the family, who of course turns out to be his mystery man. <laughs> from London and they have kind of a second chance romance while also having to deal with like a secret conspiracy and adventure things happening. I loved this. They have great banter. They've got this really cute relationship. They're quite different from each other. The plot was really engaging and really fun. I was very invested in the relationship. There were interesting quirky side characters that I enjoyed reading about and I think this did a good job of maintaining a light tone while also acknowledging some of the realities of that time period in terms of homophobia and racism and the things that queer people and queer people of color, where one of our heroes is um, has some African ancestry, are, are facing. And yet it's this fun, joyful, lovely romance novel about queer people finding a way to be together and have love, which is something that has always happened throughout history. So this was great. Five stars. Really enjoyed it. Would definitely read more from KJ Charles in the future. Finally, I have three books this month that got six stars for me, which is what I give to a favorite of the year. And two of these books I talked about in my mid-month wrap up. Those books are The Last Tale of the Flower Bride by Roshni Chakshi. This is a polarizing one, y'all, but I loved it so much. It's a lot of vibes. It's like all the vibes, but so good. And Sea of Tranquility by Emily St. John Mandel. I also talked about this one at greater length in my video where I was reading all of the sci-fi winners of the Goodreads Choice Awards for the last 10 years. If you somehow missed that video, I will link it up above or down below or wherever I can. Um, but I talked about this there. My final book that got six star reads on the last book I'm going to talk about in this video was The Girl Who Drank the Moon by Kelly Barnhill. This was so good. I read this because my patrons voted on it as something they wanted to see me do a reading vlog of. I don't know that I would have gotten to it otherwise, even though I had heard good things about it. And if I'm being honest, it's probably because it's a Newbery Award winner. Like, show of hands, people who were traumatized by Newbery Award winners in their childhood. <laughs> Maybe that's terrible, but I've tended to stay away from them. I know they're like well written, but I read so many traumatic things and I don't like that. But this was, oh my God, it was so good. The writing was amazing. How have I not read this? So I have a re reading vlog available for patrons and eligible channel members if you want to check it out. But this was just beautiful. The writing was so good and so nuanced, not just for children, but oh God. It was appropriate for kids, but had so much richness to the themes and the writing, it had fairy tale elements to it and magic. And I don't know, I, I talk about this more in my Goodreads review and in my um, my video. I don't I, I'm kind of worn out from talking about all the books in this in this video. Now, what do I want to say about this? Um, so this is a book about a town in a marsh where every year they sacrifice a newborn baby to a, a, a witch and they think that they have to do this. The leaders of the town don't think the witch actually exists. They think the baby dies, but they do it to keep the town under their control. You find this out in the first like couple chapters. Meanwhile, there actually is a witch who lives in the swamp and every year in the same place, she finds an, a, a baby that's been left for reasons that she doesn't know what they are. And so she always saves the baby and tries to find a loving home for it. <laughs> Not knowing why people keep leaving babies every year in the swamp. So one year there's a little girl that she saves and because she's not paying attention instead of just feeding her starlight to drink she accidentally feeds her moonlight which makes the girl magical. So she keeps her and raises her as her own kind of granddaughter. But then she grows up and things happen and I loved this so much. There are a lot of themes it's exploring but I think one of the big ones is the idea that who controls a narrative really matters and that stories can be used to twist the truth in a way that causes harm, which I think 
that concept and the need for things like media literacy today is so valuable for children to learn and that is one of the big themes of this book but it was just so good. I loved Luna, our main character. I loved the grumpy swamp monster that she grows up with and the little tiny dragon that believes in its heart that it's really enormous. Like it's just oh god it's so cute but it was it was amazing. I loved it. Highly recommend if you haven't read it yet. It was fantastic. So um there you go. Those are all of the very, very many books that I read in February. Let's hope that March is less of an anxiety ridden month for me so that I can read a more reasonable number of books. So like on the one hand, I'm like, hey, this was great. I got through so many books on my TBR. But on the other hand, I'm like, yeah, but I did that because my mental health was like, questionable and uh, I would prefer not to have that happen in March so like let's hope maybe we read 30 books instead of 44 that'd be that'd be great <laughs> wish me luck for March talk to me in the comments down below let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything I talked about in this video and for your question of the day talk to me about how you cope with difficult periods in life what does that look like for you? It's funny because I do know people who when they have anxiety or depression or whatever, they can't read. They're completely like, I. that's the last thing that they want to do. Whereas I'm like, give me all the light, cozy reads and romance. That's all I want. I'm just going to take lots of that and to try to make myself feel better. But I know it's different for everybody. Let me know how you handle that in the comments down below. If you like this video, it always helps if you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.